Okay, back, and looks like I should be streaming okay. Uh, let me know if audio and video are back in. Can you guys uh, see and hear me okay? Just let me know if uh, things are working out okay. Looks like we have a little hiccup somewhere between uh, OBS. Cool, cool. So, can you? Uh, sorry about that. I had my window open, which uh, had cars there. There we go. So you guys can actually see screen okay. See my mouse moving about. Strangely enough, uh, I'm not sure, but on my browser, I'm watching on another tab, and it looks like I'm not there. So I just want to make sure everybody can see everything okay. Okay. Oh, cool, 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 cool. Sorry about that. Okay, so I just want to touch upon, and uh, of course I'll, I'll start from the top again as I, I got interrupted with the, the issue there. My name is Tony Leonard. I am a concept artist. Uh, oh, cool. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, I wanted to go through and kind of... Um, show you guys some advanced steps that I took over the course of the week uh, from last time around. And uh, if you might remember, uh, again, I'm Tony Leonard. I'm a 2D, 3D illustrator and comic book artist here based out of Los Angeles, California. And uh, I want to thank uh, Pixelogic for hosting this uh, stream. And so uh, without uh, waiting along, uh, let's go ahead and get into this. So I, I started building a, a concept mesh, and ah uh, uh, yes, yes, a little, not too many Blade Runner spoilers. I won't, I won't t tell any spoilers about the movie or anything like that. But uh, I just kind of designed. A, I have been in the last uh, week or two uh, working on something it's sort of like a, a little challenge that I, I created to run alongside uh, Inktober, uh, and I produced a, a little short model here just as a sort of rough. Uh, to do an illustration behind. Uh, and so basically what you have here is just a simple model that was made in ZBrush and the directions that we wanted to go in were tried to do one for line art. So just I'll show you a little preview here of some stuff that I've been working out. Uh, this is entirely a drawing that was done between uh, ZBrush. Everything was modeled in ZBrush. Um, and we, I used uh, just Dynamesh to basically build sort of the structures up uh, off of a Q-Cube that I used Z-Modeler with for the CAD of the car. Uh, and if you're familiar, this is one of the spinners uh, from Blade Runner, and I've just been designing my own. It's sort of a challenge that I've been uh, working out where uh, I've invited people to go ahead and design their own Blade Runner car, and their own spinner and had a lot of fun with it within the last couple of weeks. Uh, guys like uh, Scott Robertson, for example, joined in the fun. Uh, a buddy of mine, uh, John Fry, he also joined in the fun. He's an industrial designer. Uh, and we've just been having some fun toying around with the, sort of the shape play of... of uh, uh, ah, cool. Glad that the audio is working out. Good. So, um, basically, I just sort of mixed up some pieces. Uh, basically, the cab was, I think, a Z modeler, Q cube, all the way straight to like a Dynamesh. Uh, I used some booleans to take out sort of like a, a shell uh, piece uh, and start cutting up uh, areas like the doors. Uh, I think this front fork, there's an area there. Uh, although in this line preview at this time, I think I rendered it with a few pieces left in, but these are actually booleaned out. The car window is actually booleaned out. Uh, and so I wanted to give you guys sort of an idea of um, how this run went. So actually, you know what, just really quick, 
I'm going to go ahead and initialize my ZBrush. And then I'm going to reopen the project. Make sure we're off to a fresh start. So anytime with the ZBrush... Hello! Hello, Gary. Uh, anytime with ZBrush, of course, you know, if you go into the preferences, you can initialize ZBrush. It kind of brings it back to a, uh, like a, a clean state. And so I'll do that now. There we go. So the blank business here. And then once it's done, I'm just going to reopen my project up again. Okay. So we'll go ahead and open it. And a lot of the work that I prepped for, um, I wanted to explain something that I actually recently found that was really cool. In fact, I didn't even know it was there, but it's so awesome that it's it's worth uh, mentioning. So this is the cab, and I just have like a, a, a material that I, I put on it that's sort of like a metallic material. Uh, I think actually these materials uh, originated, I, I might have purchased them from Nomon, the Nomon workshop at some point. But... Uh, I forget his name. There was a gentleman that had some really cool um, uh, mat caps that were sold on Nomon, and they're like all, they're all initialed RS. So like a few of them I've grabbed, but I just want to go ahead and stick something very simple on it. So I'll pick some clay, uh, and pretty much as I as I turn this, um, some of it got a little bit heavy, some of it was still pretty light. Uh, I think probably the cab section might be Dynamesh because I surfaced it a little bit uh, and did some retopology. Uh, and it's just really simple retopology just so that I could surface the, the car and define some very hard edges. So if you're familiar with ZBrush um, modeling, actually, yeah, probably the, the plugin was not that long ago. But, uh, you know, I used all of this stuff. Uh, in ZBrush, simple shapes, um, you know, using alphas to sort of stamp in and around the body, anything that I could use to create some just simple, quick details on the surface of the car. Uh, and then I probably still have the bottom half, you know, but since the view is not really from the bottom, I haven't really uh, gone in and detailed it. But probably over the course of the week, I'll take and use some insert meshes or um, insert primitives to basically sort of build out some hard surface shapes on the bottom of this. And maybe in a future stream, I'll go ahead and try to do that so that we could do a different POV. But for the most um, POV, meaning a point of view, uh, for those that are not familiar with the term, but um, I have just like a simple perspective on this. So uh, I think using your draw size, uh, the angle of view is set kind of high. Uh, usually, like, I set this to about 35 when I'm working on something like characters or something like that. Uh, 55, I think, is in and around the default, uh, but I switched it up to 88 uh, just to have a little bit more of an extreme view. And for the first time ever, and I'm actually going to try this today, um, it usually takes a moment to put these out if you have a lot of subtools. So I think uh, right now I probably have like maybe over 20 subtools at least uh, in here in various bits because I wanted to separate a lot of smaller objects so that I could actually place materials on them in Keyshot. Uh, and in this there's a few spots where I have used either my own kit bash sets uh, for a little bit of shape language and I think a few of these pieces uh, of course come from uh, Vitaly Bulgarov who has awesome kit bash sets. Uh, usually, rule of thumb, and I think I've mentioned this before, is when I use kit bash sets on certain models or something like that, or if I'm trying some things out, uh, a kit bash is basically random bits that you can use as insert meshes uh, to kind of add some detail or shape language to a model that you build. Uh, and therefore, I used a few pieces sparingly. Um, but most of these shapes should be already surfaced. Uh, Kind of like this, I think maybe in a previous stream, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, you might have seen me actually piece together certain objects that had uh, topology done for it, and I used the append method uh, Z-sphere topology uh, to block some of these pieces out, uh, which allows me to go in with the Z modeler tool and 
add increasing and therefore harden up an object once I subdivide it and then I think I switched it over to Dynamesh uh, in a resolution somewhere in and around like 580 I believe is where it was but here for example I can show you so yeah this is like a 580 which I think it defaults to 584 uh, using polish after uh, pulling out some parts using the Z modeler I think uh, I plucked out a few faces and then used uh, reinforced edge uh, edge loops to go in and around the, the block and just keep it sort of like uh, hardened up just ever so slightly uh, and then I think I stamped out some areas along the side to give it some detail uh, just for a simple object so there was that uh, and of course when you turned it into Dynamesh uh, it added in some faces here that, that are just kind of rough so later I would probably work with this and maybe you know uh, do as uh, a Z remesher on it uh, get the topology a little bit more tightened up or and or retopologize it after I've done some surface detail right so skipping some of the modeling half I'm going to show all of these sub tools again there we go there's probably a few that I need to turn off uh, let's see turn this guy off and there was one operation here where I'm going to sh show you how I did some of the doors here so let me get back to the body shape I need to turn it off and a lot of times I actually need to go through and clean up this file quite a bit uh, just so that uh, when I go through this some of the materials have proper naming conventions so that it becomes easier to um, so that it becomes easier for me to go ahead and you know uh, add a material to once I shoot it over to Keyshot but uh, Let's see here. Just need to find one other piece. Let's see where it. I think it's the doors that are actually the old doors. There we go. All right. So this is basically. Uh, oh, there's still a piece in there. Hold on one sec. That guy I need to hide, I believe, and this guy here. So there are still sections here where uh, I started a, a, a parent group for doing a Boolean operation, and some of those pieces I just need to hide. Uh, some of them probably I will later delete, but uh, once I've worked them out, I actually need to turn them off. There we go. Okay, so something like this is what I rendered turn it just ever so slightly and I actually used uh, for the first time the ZBrush uh, Photoshop CC plugin and this is super awesome if you haven't ever played with this I, I do encourage all to really check it out um, I didn't even know it was there uh, actually until very recently and I was like once I found it I was like oh my god this is the best thing since sliced bread uh, and really it is uh, because rather than doing um, the regular way of going through doing the, the render tab and checking out the BPR render passes and being able to use BPR to just do a render and then clicking and exporting all of these uh, it shoots everything out all in one go uh, sometimes it can take a, a few minutes if you have a lot of sub tools but I outputted AO BPR uh, or ambient occlusion in the, the best possible render depth mask uh, lights uh, changed it up from preview to best uh, shot out the specular shadows uh, and some of the materials as well and I think I went through here and tried to uh, program a few materials and once it came out I'm gonna switch over to Photoshop just momentarily here this became the final result now this is uh, using a little bit of overpainting uh, quite a bit a lot of overpainting actually and don't be intimidated by my file structure here but uh, in the layers I have quite a few uh, that I use to do a paint over but at its base in fact uh, let's see, let's switch all of these off 
including that guy. Usually everything comes out to these. So I'll turn all of the actual base stuff back on. And you can see from where I started. I don't know if all of these were in there at the time, but pretty much I started from something like this. All right. And once I had the material placed, I think um, there's a couple of other masks that I use. I did a clown pass, which is awesome because it'll arrange every uh, mask into a layer mask. Uh, and quite simply, you could just take this, take an area and right click it and just add mask to selection in Photoshop and begin painting in a specific area. So this is, this is some really great stuff here. I could deselect it and switch, you know, to a, everything, uh, including uh, inverting the mask and whatnot. So I use this mask to basically sort of mask things off, and then I put like a, a couple of gradations on top to give it some atmosphere. Uh, gradations here, and this was the beginning of my base. So I think I have a couple of other layers on the bottom that I used, uh, including a city grid. And so from this, this is kind of where I started uh, as a start point. All right. And so with this in mind, I had a, a beautiful shot. So yes, uh, the background there with the city lights is actually a photo, a real photo that my wife took uh, when she was off on a business trip. She was gracious enough to shoot some ref for me, which is awesome. And so this is actually LA's grid here. Uh, and I think I placed it and edited it use the transform tool to sort of get a perspective that I wanted out of it uh, and then eventually added a few other screens and those screens became sort of the backdrop for the overpainting. So as I work a lot of the times uh, I edit the actual materials that are in here uh, and then I keep adding some uh, process. So whatever type of layer adjustments that I do uh, sometimes I'll add in some of these uh, as I can find slowly put them on, turn them on here, make those layers visible. Uh, there are areas that have debris, uh, where I used actual uh, debris marks and put those in. Other additional buildings and lights were added in. And I gradually sort of comp these in uh, until I get a more finished results and then compact the folder. And anytime I start painting, uh, this is sort of like a, a big Photoshop thing, but uh, I would make comps interstitially, like uh, maybe I get to one point in painting and then I would, you know, uh, merge some of the layers onto one layer and then additionally start working uh, on another area. So in a lot of ways, like uh, some of the decals and things that needed to be turned on, uh, slowly I, I added little details. Uh, using again the transform uh, to place some of these uh, objects per the, the perspective and then what I would do is I would just tweak it uh, sometimes using things like wrap or skew to get some of the wording or lettering uh, and kind of uh, a neat trick uh, a lot of these decals are actually decals off of model kits uh, where I actually took and placed them uh, using quick mask and separate them out and then place them into the painting uh, so that it sort of gives it a sort of lived in look where some decals exist uh, on the actual model. Uh, cloud brushes, uh, I think I used for some of the clouds here. So this is a, a great example of doing something that where I have a, a model that originated in ZBrush and then afterwards uh, I did some overpainting and some adjustment layers to give it sort of a cinematic painting look. So this is sort of uh, one exercise that uh, I went through. Uh, and additionally, from Keyshot, I sent the model over to, uh, from ZBrush to Keyshot, excuse me. So I will go ahead and unpause this, have it sitting for a little bit. Uh, and it would be a view just like this. If, if I needed to do something where I needed to change some of the silhouette of the, the model or, um, Perhaps if I needed to uh, 
you know, change the design entirely, I could output um, a tune shaded view of the model, and then, yeah, it, it includes a real LA smog on the uh, previous piece, yes. Uh, I wanted to actually make it as sort of environmentally choked as possible, so uh, using sort of the theme of the burned orange from the Las Vegas shots of the 2049 film, uh, I kind of uh, switched it and uh, color graded it a little bit so that it would everything would be almost sort of monochromatic into to one like choked smoky feel. So and it worked out. So added a few alphas that uh, I used as selections, uh, which is sort of a trick that I should uh, probably show you guys. Uh, in fact, yeah, let me see if I can find it uh, in. The channels, I saved out some of my own channels for textures, uh, and I use this as a selection. So if you're familiar with uh, quick masking, a lot of times some of these channels, like if you find a texture that would be interesting to paint on or give you sort of a, a rustic look, uh, I would just take and po uh, paste a black and white grayscale uh, image into the alpha channel, and then I could click and drag the uh, channel layer right here to this little dotted circle here, which is basically the marquee, and it turns it into a selection. If I hit Q and go, oops, actually probably I need to turn this off, there we go. Uh, and with the marquee tool, of course, you can just grab the selection and move it around. So for example, if I wanted to paint it on this layer, uh, what I would do is just take this, find a spot, an open spot for this uh, texture and just pull it down to the area where I wanted to paint it. Uh, let's say right up here maybe I'll do some texture. And then I would just hide it using Control H and I'll grab a similar color to use like maybe this darker color here and just grab like a regular brush. Uh, let's find something with a nice texture to it. Or maybe not. Let's see. I'll grab something like that. Okay, and then I will turn down the opacity a bit. Uh, actually, let's choose something else. I'll choose an actual brush, but I'll change the opacity down to something light. There we go. And blow it up a little bit. And on a separate layer, I might start uh, painting in just like some darker color. Looks like it didn't grab it. There we go. Maybe turn this up just a tad. Ah, that's why it's not working. Need to pull this up a little bit. Sorry about that. So there we go. Uh, and once I paint in some dirt, I just come in with the eraser and mix it out. Make it a little bit lighter again. And I'll just do like an area for coverage. And then I'll erase it again. It's a pretty simple trick. Uh, but the neat thing about doing uh, texture this way, uh, just for, you know, sort of like a light texture effect, is of course I can do adjustments on this and take this and maybe turn it to something like a, either a screen or a linear dodge. Uh, sometimes overlay works as well, gives it a nice little sort of like uh, stained vintage look and, and you could, you know, create some blemishes on the surface, somewhat like that, uh, drop the opacity down, what have you. Yeah. Or uh, if you had the texture as a whole, of course, you could add a layer mask and work non-destructively on your artwork, right? So there's a few other things here that are going on that are actually interesting. Uh, but the most important part is that it's very easy to take a model from ZBrush, uh, even if it's a simple one uh, with not a whole lot of work or maybe not even thinking about you know topology or correct edge flow or 
uh, you know, resolution per se, kick it out into a render, and then um, be able to take it and use it for an illustration. Hey Doug, uh, how's it going? Uh, you were asking if I use a Cintiq or a Wacom Intuos. I actually use both. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a strange thing, but I actually don't prefer to sculpt on a Cintiq. I actually like using a tablet because it seems more tactile to me, but uh, I have I, and can do it on a Cintiq, but I use my Cintiq mostly for illustration and painting, uh, and then I use my Intuos uh, for actually sculpting or and or doing 3D. Yeah. Um, it's kind of crazy how it works out. Sometimes it's just I, I don't know for whatever reason I I, I don't sculpt very much, often on a Cintiq. I always like uh, using a flat uh, table surface to start sculpting. Did anyone else have any questions before I move along? If so, please do let me know. Yeah, uh, smog is a nice touch. Uh, Photoshop does have some big updates to it, yes. In fact, uh, last night I just moved from 2017 to 18 because I noticed quite a few versions had passed since I had last updated uh, because I, I actually subscribed to Adobe um, and I upgraded it. But pretty much things are consistent. Uh, there's a few changes to the brushes, actions, and tool presets, I think. Uh, some organizational things that they made changes to. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty neat for, for doing a, a render. Uh, and some of these layers, I used a little bit of noise uh, after applying some screens. Uh, and a lot of the atmospherics have to do with applying some screens and color balances. So every few, uh, every few steps that I would go through a process in, in Photoshop, I would do something like this. Uh, here's a little bit of a tip for you, but if you, um, here, I'll turn the type off, and I'll just go right above some effects for the thrust wave. So there's a little bit of motion blur that's worked into here. Uh, there we go. Uh, here at the end, and this is kind of a neat trick that I, I actually learned, <laughs> I had to look it up, but I had to, I actually learned this from, from Scott Robertson, is um, I have a, a copy of a masked off area that I copied and pasted twice here. And this is just the, the tail and the edge of the spinner and back of it. Uh, and they both have a filter called, here actually, let me grab this. They both have a filter called, from the filter gallery and the filters in Photoshop. And I noticed that uh, if you use glass and play with the smoothness and distortion, uh, and sometimes the scaling, that you can grab a certain area and distort it, almost like a, a heat plume from like an exhaust. So I use this effect basically to, you know, uh, put sort of a, a ripple, like, a, like a, a, a sort of heat ripple at the back of the spinner so that it looks like it's emanating some kind of heat as it's traveling out of its engine. Right. And then I tried it in one as a fine ripple and one as a large ripple, uh, and it worked out pretty good. Uh, I just blend the two by changing the opacity. So a lot of fun stuff to and small tricks that you can do to kind of tighten it up and make it look uh, a little bit more cinematic, uh, like you know maybe some special effects were, were to be applied, and it ends up uh, being pretty cool. So I'm just going to turn some stuff back on here. And at last, the top comp uh, of this. So let's turn these off just one more time. And then after everything that I've rendered, I just come in and I make a new layer placed above everything else. And it's sort of a short order thing, but every, every few uh, bits of process, I'll take and hold down Alt. And if you select uh, Merge Visible, from the layer menu, it'll actually comp everything into one layer. So, and then I would just double tap and call this comp. Uh, or in this case, the last comp. Right? 
so another way, and I think I mentioned this before, but I'm going to try it again, is to take some line art. Now this line art was produced again from Keyshot, I believe Keyshot 6 or 7, uh, and I'm just using the Tune Shader. And to pick up a lot of these details, what I've done is um, cranked up inside of Keyshot the... In fact, here, let me bring up the material. So if I choose Edit Material on all of these, the contour width is about 0 0.7 pixels, and then the angle I've set, I think, a little bit low, like 10.2. Uh, that way, it picks up a lot of the surface details a little bit more while I'm working. Right? So even if I've sculpted into just like a simple piece of clay, or if I have uh, geometrically correct uh, bits of um, geometry in here that actually have uh, polys and nice loops, maybe some nice edge flow to them, uh, with, with no faceting, then I can use these to define some of the line art, right? So basically I would take a, a render like this, and let's just say for example sake, I go ahead and render it. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit Control P and render. Uh, and then here I think uh, I'm going to leave it as a JPEG. And of course I'm going to switch it up to 300 DPI because uh, that's the size that I usually work at for a lot of things. And preset size, I think I'm going to go with something a little high. Uh, let's see. Here, I'll just do it. Maybe here. So I'll use a preset for it. So it'll be 8 by 5 basically in print size at 300 dpi with a pixel size of 2560 by 1707. Uh, and I can choose which layer passes that I want. Uh, like say for example if I want different sections of a clown pass, if I'm painting, I can use those later. Um, and then I can actually select, you know, other areas that have like, you know, reflection or shadow information and it will actually parse it out. Uh, and make them different layers. However, for this I just need the flat line art, so I really don't need much of this. So I'm not going to choose any clown pass settings or anything else. Uh, no region, and I'm just going to go ahead and render it. So this will take just a second to render. Any questions you guys want to ask me again while I'm doing a render? This is actually probably not going to take that long, but I'll be happy to answer anything that I can. Uh, for Photoshop, I usually work, um, strangely enough, when I was living overseas, I, I worked a lot in A3 size uh, or A4 size, uh, which is like an international paper size. Uh, and I believe um, on top of which, uh, just like letter size, uh, I use, also use some 9 by 12, uh, 11 by 14, and 14 by 17 sizes of paper, uh, generally when I do stuff by hand, uh, and then if I render it or I build something off of it. But usually just as far as DPI goes, like uh, there's a few paintings, like say uh, this cinematic piece that I did in Photoshop. Um, I actually resed up to about a 4K size, uh, which when I looked, I think it was like uh, 3,800 pixels wide. In fact, here you go. So 3,840, I believe, by 26 and some change. Uh, I think I did a quick Google on a 4K size, but I think I cropped ever so slightly. So uh, it's not a, a typical size that I would work at, but. If I just wanted enough pixels to work in sort of 4K to see how it would look on a big screen, uh, I can try it and size it up, and then I just kept painting and adding some smaller details. Uh, generally, a lot of my illustration work, I, you know, it, it just depends on what requirements I have or, or what format. For, for comics, it's, it's different. Uh, for illustration, you know, sort of at sometimes carte blanche, or if I have a client that has a specific uh, uh, criteria for size and uh, resolution, then I, I will match that and just plan around it. No, I didn't do this in 33 minutes. That would be awesome, though, if I could. <laughs> Actually, uh, I think I painted this night before last, uh, and I painted it just because I had been experimenting with sort of uh, 
the tools in this uh, Photoshop CC plugin inside of uh, inside of uh, ZBrush, and I had to gradually sort of add steps, and then I would render uh, a few times and see how they came out. Uh, so. Basically something like this, I'll, I'll try to run this while we're in the stream today and see how it comes out, but um, it's pretty much like I showed earlier. Uh, in fact, I don't know if I want to take the time to do it because it would take probably about 10 or 15 minutes sometimes to go cycle through all of... What it does is it basically cycles through all of the visible, visible sub-tools and then it sets up clown passes, everything that I have checked here. So um, sub-tool mask, it made, uh, made a whole group folder full of... Uh, layers for all of the masks for each subtool, and then it cycled through and it, it gave me uh, a tangent space normal, that's what this TS normal here means, in fact I'm going to hit shift M and get out my loop tool and show you. So this is uh, uh, tangent space normal, subtool masks, uh, I actually have a material that's sort of a specular material so I kicked out a spec, I changed from uh, I'm not sure why preview is still checked. I probably need to uncheck it because I'm sure it's probably somewhere close to being the same as the best. But I clicked on best so that I get a tighter render. Uh, and lights, which is really cool because uh, if I go back, yeah, let's go back to Photoshop just for a moment. Okay, so in this guy here, if I go through and I'm going to unclick everything and go back to my bottom layers. I'm changing that. Actually, that doesn't need to be on. Okay, so this was basically the core group here. This is how it came out uh, when I used the Photoshop plugin. And again, looking at the file structure, or the layer structure, um, in the effects, I believe, here is the ambient occlusion that it made. Here is the spec that it made, uh, which is really cool. I'm not sure how much specular information I'm getting, but I could always do another pass with a sort of chrome material and place it right over that, uh, provided that I locked in the camera view. Uh, and also, here is the tangent space normal. I think I made a copy only uh, because I actually used a different uh, uh, I used a different action to see if I could make a curvature pass on it, uh, which does and doesn't work a little bit. It didn't have that much of an impression on things, but I could take uh, a tangent space normal uh, somewhat similar to this, and then use uh, sort of an action to change that into a, a curvature map, uh, which if I select it and then it's inverted, I could probably get some edge wear in on some of the model, or some of the, the model's planner changes, right? So I can create sort of like a, an edge wear on the, the object. But um, lots of useful layers in here to actually check out, and I, I really suggest anybody who's going to toy with this should check it out, uh, because there's some really cool stuff in here. So, I'll unplug that. Uh, but one of the interesting things that I wanted to show you guys um, is some of the lights. Uh, this is really cool. If you have lighting information, you can actually use some of those lights in here. Uh, I'm not sure if it actually set up specific lights or if it made some at random, but uh, it did make lights all around the model, and I can click and turn these off, or I can turn some other lights on uh, and blend them using the opacity sliders. So any of these, you know, like if it's 80%, I can bump it up back to 100 uh, and get some lighting information, depending on what kind of shadows that you want uh, and lighting that you want to uh, add to your model. So I started lighting it up something like this. Uh, which was one of the lights, two, a few of the lights that didn't cast too many bad, hard shadows. Uh, of course, your shadow information you can change in the BPR settings uh, to accommodate you know, the look and feel of what you want to design. Uh, and then, I think later on down the line, once I started processing the image, I thought that a lot of the details on the surface were getting kind of lost. Uh, 
and therefore I took it and uh, created sort of an effects layer uh, somewhere along the line uh, and then used a yeah, let me turn everything back on. There we go. So I turned everything back on uh, and started actually using a layer that had an effect for emboss, uh, which created like a nice little detail. So you can do something like that where if you're doing a paint over, you could uh, create a new layer and then pick like a darker recess color uh, to go into some of these cavities. And just with a small brush, uh, if you double tap on the layer, and then I would check on bevel and emboss, uh, and depending some of these, uh, you could click it. Uh, I think inner bevel smooth, uh, and I shortened the distance of the the reflection so that I could angle it along to match the sort of the lights, and then I would just paint in paint in an actual cut line and it would give me an embossed edge so that's what you're looking at for certain details like this uh, I don't think I did I said I didn't have but two lights in the the overall image uh, so when I actually exported it I think there were lighting there was lighting information that had not been there that is there now uh, okay, let me see if I go back down I'm going to turn everything off once more and just show some of the beginning parts. So, that needs to go, this needs to be unchecked. Actually, that was new. But the, the folder does. Uh, effects geometry. Uh, let's get back to it. Turn that on so that I can turn it off. Okay, and lights. There we go. So all of these lights, I think they're actually they were preset in there somehow. Maybe it used the default because I actually had the lights in a totally different uh, different area. Can Kale, the image resolution for the painting that I did, I actually sized it up uh, and tried to do some like light wrap on it so that I could decrease some of the aliasing around the side. Sometimes when I do a BPR, uh, if the resolution is quite low, I get this you know sort of bitmap step uh, selection around the edges, uh, and I'll do something like using a light wrap uh, to actually soften the edges. It's basically just an overall mask around the outside. So if you look here in your layers where you have uh, like layer masks for these, I could add these to a selection and then just uh, invert the selection so everything on the outside is selected. And then I can take and just go select, uh, I think modify and then feather it or smooth it uh, it also works. And then I would just uh, do like a delete or a, a backspace that would take out sort of like one or two pixels along the edge and smooth it out. Uh, or sometimes I just paint straight over it. So it doesn't, it's not, this is actually, the source of this was not the highest resolution. Uh, as I'm working now, I've switched the resolution uh, to a 4K size, and I believe I bumped it up to maybe 300 DPI, um, which is something that you could do. But as long as the, the pixel information is there, it probably, uh, DPI doesn't matter as much, right? So, yeah, I think they were some, some default lights. Uh, SQL Rush. So as soon as I had those in, uh, I came back down and just turned on a few lights uh, that were interesting, and then I built up the rest of the painting, uh, gradually making comps interstitially. So every time I do like some effects, or every time I would do a little bit of paint over information, I would group those layers into a folder uh, so that I could easily find them. So a few of them are like my early process. So like upper adjustments is a, a, a painting for a while. Um, paint over process is maybe a little bit more detail. Uh, and then I have to go back and probably turn on a bunch of these. Let me actually 
go back up here. I think I might have accidentally turned a bunch of them off. It needs to cycle through. Sorry about that. Let me skip back over to Keyshot for a minute. So still rendering a little bit. It's probably actually taking a little bit longer than I wanted to. Uh, you, I forgot to set it for time, uh, so it's probably using maximum time to render it, but it should probably finish here in a bit. But I'll come back to this now and just show you things. So this is about my last bit of work on this one, on this layer here. Uh, and then I just added all of the other smaller things like uh, titles and stuff on top of that. But uh, lastly, I think when I finished painting everything, I added some noise and a few uh, Gaussian effects around the edges to sort of soften things out. And so a lot of those stepped areas I would either paint out uh, that I was talking about, or, you know, if the resolution doesn't really doesn't matter that much, uh, for a comp, it really doesn't matter, I guess, but, uh, to be neat about it, I, I think I, around the edges I might have, like, some, uh, chromatic aberration and whatnot set up, uh, but all of the details sort of fuse very nicely. Uh, a lot of the gradations for the tonality of the, uh, piece were done, uh, as screen layers, just, you know, simple gradation, gradations. So, if you hit G on the keyboard, uh, and then select your gradation style, I think I, I did mine with a transparency at the end, uh, and then I would just, you know, sort of blanket swaths of areas that were just going to be like a high orange or a high yellow, uh, and then I comped them in, and then started painting again. And then I used a few adjustment layers, if you'll notice, uh, probably... Certain areas I use adjustment layers like curves and levels, uh, and then additionally I think uh, maybe in some of the earlier parts of this, uh, some of these were, yeah, screen or overlay, uh, and then I just play with the different blend modes until I'm happy with, with the result that I get. Uh, I think uh, I painted this in a night, uh, probably three hours, four hours. So actually not that not that long at all. Once I once I had the base render from ZBrush, it allowed me to kind of go in uh, and just add sort of an atmosphere to uh, again, of course the the city grid uh, was uh, placed from a photo and then once I added in those those uh, overlays uh, and also screens, I, I try to mess with the overlays for the for the tonal value of the orange and then, I think I, I added a few other adjustment layers to just get the right balance of color. Uh, there's very little in the way of cools in this. It's very mo monochromatic. And I think the buildings itself, I just did a quick little draw-in of the buildings. Uh, and then once I blurred it, maybe messed with the opacity, it sort of blends in a little bit more. In fact, I could probably paint stand to paint these up a little bit more had I given it more time uh, so that the buildings stand out. And then put sort of cloud material in between and I think there's a little bit of debris that I tried to use to, to add some like sort of uh, dust bits floating about and then I used a separate effect uh, as I mentioned from the filter gallery uh, to create sort of like a heat wave and I think this bottom edge here and along the edge of the craft it has a motion blur to sort of simulate some motion so all in all I think I worked on this for about probably three and a half, maybe four hours, uh, just sitting at home, uh, messing around with the, the Photoshop filter. Uh, SQL Rush, to answer your question, what can you advise for someone planning to make a big image to cover a whole wall? Uh, wow, for that one, I would, I would probably see what kind of size that the printer could work with. Um, to actually, you know, what kind of resolution that you need to, to work with for a huge, like, wall size banner, because I, I think probably a printer would need to uh, create sort of like a, a banner sized uh, image, and they would probably roll it off of a, a huge banner, uh, or print it out in chunks maybe and pair it together, I'm not exactly sure. I haven't actually done something that big, so uh, I would probably talk with a, a printer and see you know, what kind of setup and what kind of resolution that you would need so that they could print it all right. 
but uh, I suppose if you were doing it in four color, you could probably have it done. Uh, and if you talk to some printers, actually they will give you uh, probably like a template of some kind to use so that it's an easy setup for you to do the artwork, place it on a template, and then uh, five, five meters, five meters by three meters. Wow, that's, that's pretty big. <laughs> I would I would actually talk to a, a printer about that and see what kind of criteria they might have for you to do or produce artwork uh, for a size of that matter uh, because I'm not exactly sure what the resolutions get into I would imagine you know upwards of 600 to 1200 DPI for something that big uh, and then you know probably have to knock a few layers down uh, otherwise you would end up with a very large file I'm sure but if it's everything's flattened, everything's done, you could probably turn over a TIFF that size, and they would probably print out like a beauty. Uh, provided that, of course, the ink coverage for such a thing uh, falls within, you know, whatever again what requirements a printer has. Uh, so I would give them a call and, and see if there, if you have a printer in mind that you're planning on using, uh, then you know, uh, I'm sure they could help you out with. You know, however you wanted to print a huge banner size. Okay, so let me see if this render here is done. Almost, almost. So this should be nice and tight. So if you notice, um, one of the things about doing this is I should explain that uh, there's kind of two different looks. One look being through Keyshot 7 uh, or 6 whatever version of Keyshot that you're using, I think probably 6 and above would have uh, uh, the same t tone shader in it. Um, if you are using it, remember to change some of these angle, uh, the angle, the width, uh, and now I think with 7 you can change the transparency if you wanted to do some transparency effects, uh, and the shadow strength every once in a while. Um, I don't really have that much as far as like a lot of shadows in here, and I probably if I killed the shadows this small uh, gray area would probably be knocked out, which would probably be best for what I'm going to do. But I'm just going to go with this one. It's probably the cleaner of the two, right? Um, and uh, whatever width is changed is how thick that you're going to be on here. But to say, to say this uh, once more, you can do a lot of these same effects inside of ZBrush alone if you just have ZBrush. So. Um, changing, I think I made a material and I searched for a few myth materials uh, to use uh, that would be similarly inclined, but a lot of them are just like a regular outline material uh, inside of ZBrush with a white fill, and I think I had a 3D pulsterization cranked up pretty high, so probably like uh, anything in and around between 60 and 76 I think worked out. It's um, kind of one of those things that I needed to toy with it, and I think I have the actual material. Uh, I still have to see how I can share that with you guys. Um, but it does work, and you can put it inside of uh, uh, your materials in ZBrush and then apply it and then do a very similar type of render. Uh, with this one, it looks a little bit more stenciled and a little bit more clean, and a lot of these, because I want to use this as a base for illustration, I'm going to add details and change a bunch of stuff up uh, normally if I was just drawing. So let's say, okay, I go with that illustration. Uh, I'm close this. And flip over to Photoshop. And I need to open up the file that I just rendered. So. Source area. See where it went. Almost got lost there for a second. Hold on. There we go. Got to look at my renderings. All right. There we are. I'll open this guy up. And we'll take a look. So a little cleaner than this one. This is a uh, probably a higher resolution render and I'll full screen it. So something like this uh, probably comes in and it's probably an RGB, right? But for the sake of this demo, I think it would probably be best to show you again and reiterate some steps that I've taken before to do such line art. 
uh, I want to change it over to grayscale uh, because basically what I'm going to do is do a line separation where I take all of the line and I'm going to kick out all of the aliased gray information and be left with heavy black ink on the paper, right? And when you look at it, I'm going to run also tolerance, which is going to straighten out a lot of these details. So actually, it might be a good idea to take this and I'll do a little bit of adjusting. Okay. So uh, close that. I have my own action for this, but basically what it's going to do is uh, I have an action set up for scanning line art uh, and then cleaning it up and then separating the line art out. But if I was to run this post scanning here, uh, and I actually sell this as a part of another kit uh, of you know tools that I sell on Gumroad. Uh, it's sort of like my uh, manga manga mega kit that I put together, uh, full of like you know comic book stuff, uh, like on onomatopoeias and other tools for for doing comic book illustration. Uh, but what I like to do is usually I need to take this gray channel and create a selection from it. But I want to clean it up a little bit. So what I'm going to do is maybe not do threshold quite yet. So I'll uncheck that one. And I just want to do the levels and curves. So I'll hit play on that. And so it cleaned up a lot of the material. Maybe it left a little, a few areas a little light where the the light is a little bit small, or the line is a little bit small. Yeah, I'm basically using the render as a base to sketch from. So, but first I want to clean it up uh, and sort it out and get it separated so that I can use it on a transparent layer, right? So after I do something like that and get it a little bit more strengthened, a little bit more reinforced as far as some of the darker uh, ink lines. Uh, I ran uh, levels and curves. I'm gonna not gonna mess with threshold, which would actually threshold would kick all of these little small gray pixels out, and I might lose some detail. So to keep it in for now, uh, generally for printing, it's kind of healthy to not have that in there, uh, as a lot of gray pixels or alias pixels can, you know, they don't print well if it's like say offset printing. But for something like, um, you know, just screen uh, illustration or maybe just a, a digital, digitally printed uh, piece of work, it's not going to matter much, much. So I'm just going to go ahead and separate the line art now. So uh, let's go ahead and in my actions, I'm going to click this one here, which is my line work masking separator. And... I'm going to click also here. This is kind of hard to see, but it's basically changing the swatches for the foreground and background color to a default. And so now I just have a pure black in the foreground and also white in the background. All right? And if I run this, basically it's going to give me a Photoshop layer setup like this, where it's just white background and then all of my line art exists on a transparent layer. Right, and so from here, of course, naturally I can go ahead and paint if I want. Uh, I'll just choose a hard round. And I'll change the size of the brush. And of course, just like anything, you can uh, paint underneath. Probably if I do anything in color, I'm going to change it from grayscale back over to RGB or CMYK, and then. Most importantly, do not do not flat. Don't flat, right? Because if you flatten it, then you would have to do this process all over again. Uh, and in the setup, uh, of course, this is on a transparent layer, but there's also the channels. It made a channel using Quick Mask uh, and saved it as a line mask. So if at any time while you're working, um, if you mess up the line art or accidentally erase it or do anything to it, you can always just take this again bring it in as a selection. I'll hide that mask. And, you know, on another layer, if you need to say, maybe do it a different color, you can fill that. And it would be like a, you can change the, the color of the line art or refill your line art in black and have it if you'd like. So pretty much the, the option to do anything you'd like uh, from Go 
is there. Uh, actually, let me cancel that. Let's go over to here. I'll pick some nice comic colors and come in here. And 100%, you could just paint right in here. All right. So all your line art is there as a base start. Or, if you're not painting or coloring it over, if you're just doing line art itself, what I like to do a lot of times, as I mentioned, I might have areas that I want to change. I'll come in and dim this down and use this as a basis for a new drawing. Like so. I can go and hit the out the outlines of this. Uh, maybe change up the brush. Uh, put in some shape dynamic. Uh, pressure size. And literally draw in everything. In fact, this is so straight line that if you wanted an illustration with more uh, accentuated line or line quality, uh, literally you could come in and you know start adding some of your own hand-drawn touch to it and make it a little more flavored than just like a like a straight line right so then you could just totally redraw the rest of the image if you wanted to, or add shapes. With vectors? Yes. And in fact, um, I, it's almost funny, uh, Siegel Rush, you're asking me about uh, possibly using some of this line art uh, uh, to produce vectors. Yes, if you had a shape in ZBrush, and you do it this way where you kick it over to Keyshot, and you actually put like a line uh, or a tune shader on it, uh, and the same thing goes again for doing a VPR render. You could also uh, produce it as line art. And then once you have that 300 uh, DPI image, uh, I would save it as a probably like a grayscale or like a TIFF with like tolerance, you know, maybe even a bitmap image. Uh, you can bring it into Illustrator and it would actually live trace it if you, if you wanted to. And you would just have to dab... Uh, probably mess around with the live trace features to tighten up some of the tolerance uh, so that it, it has enough detail and, and contour to really make some nice vectors out of it. But it, yes, you can change this sort of thing into vectors inside of uh, Illustrator. Uh, sometimes I work with, with vectors, but uh, usually it's for, for other things than illustration. I like to draw a lot of things, or I'll draw something like um, a lot of times I, I make onomatopoeias or, or comic book sound effects in Illustrator, uh, or I make uh, silhouettes in Illustrator uh, a lot, and for that it's really great. But for something like this, I just use the straight up uh, line art uh, from the render into inside of Photoshop uh, for for Illustrator purposes. So like, uh, if it was comics, from going from panel to panel, I don't have to. Um, really uh, do a, a drawing over and over again, I can pretty much just sort of uh, uh, sort of continue on and, and, and change the angle, re-render it, put it in layout, uh, and then ink it down or paint it, uh, that sort of thing. All right. So any last questions before I let you guys go for this one? I, I think I was going to go for an hour and a half, but I might actually cut just short of that. So I'm watching the clock and I, I want to create some time for the next creator to come in. So if you guys have any last questions, I would totally be willing to answer them. And again, you know, this, this is just straight up 300 dpi line art from a, a model done in ZBrush. Uh, and as long as the geometry is pretty clean, uh, like in here, probably some of this I would erase naturally, but uh, you could probably take some of this and erase it out, redraw it, uh, edit the image in such a way where it's a nice clean form uh, and then do a paint over it of it or uh, in a lot of cases like you guys have seen me done in some previous streams you could put halftone screens on it uh, if you're going for sort of like a comic book feel uh, or you could take it into other applications that are popular to use 
3D vector? Uh, probably. I actually don't. I'm not a, a 3DS Max user, uh, and I haven't messed around with any of the the features like using vectors there. Uh, the only place pretty much that I use vectors is inside of Illustrator. Uh, it's usually, you know, like I do a lot of uh, graphics for maybe like a HUD or, you know, logotype information. Uh, sometimes every once in a while, like I said, for onomatopoeias or hand-drawn sources that I want to change into vector and then edit so that they're cleaner, um, I'll use it for purposes like that. Cheers! Thanks a lot, Doug. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys, for joining me. And again, thanks again to Pixelogic for hosting these this series of streams. Uh, it's been really fun, and I guess uh, I may not see you guys next weekend, but probably after that I'll come back with another model, uh, and we'll go through a, f a few other maneuvers. Oh, lastly, before I actually go, there was one small step that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, there were some things here as far as the model's front, uh, probably the circular detail and the door detail. So. This is actually really cool. If I had a little bit more time, I should probably save it for next time, but uh, this is actually some of the Boolean effects. So just to show you in my sub-tools, uh, some really cool stuff. I did not only just like just kit bashing stuff, but I just took like simple geometry. Uh, so, you know, basically speaking to the fact that a lot of these, this geo, it doesn't always need to be overly complex to come up with something that's pretty impressive. Uh, I think uh, I showed you guys in previous stream, I think it was the last one, where I was doing some retopo, and although it was kind of slow to, to watch it, once I created a, a, a bit of geometry for the door, I basically just used a poly group on the inside of the door, uh, and then I made a duplicate and hid the rest of the door and only kept the window. Uh, and then extruding the shape that I had masked out, uh, I gave it some thickness and came in and shoved it through the, the geometry of the door and created a boolean out of it. So if I was to go and show you, actually, let me see here. I'll select the doors because I know they're sitting around there. That's that piece. I get no preview. Ah, yes. So this is the cylinder up front and that's the start, the start of the start group. Uh, let me see, I think I probably have to go up a little bit more. Ah, yes, here we go. So this was the door of the car, right? And this is really cool to do, but if um, I look at the polygroups of it, here is basically where I drew a mask. Cool, thank you. Um, but I drew a mask out of uh, just using the regular mask brush, uh, just like a standard brush, and I played with it, tightened it up, blurred it, and then resharpened it, uh, edited, it and edited it into the shape that I wanted for the windows, uh, and then I think I did it twice. So there was a lower window and an upper window, and a lot of the shape language from this, this the, the original drawing that I did of such a spinner, I tried to take some, some influences not only from the spinner in the movie, but also I would think I was looking at a, a Maserati. I had some ref of a Maserati Boomerang, I believe was the car. And it had a really cool angular sort of like 80s look to it. But anyway, just in short, uh, created the door and made it a star. And then the parts that I plucked out of it were these. Uh, so I'm going to actually hide that. And I'll show this. And I'll show this. So right now, in the render tab, I actually have uh, live render turned on. So render booleans, live render is turned on. But it turned off, it looks exactly like this, right? So here's the shape that I cleaned up, and I actually shoved it through the geometry for the door, right? Just gave it a little bit of thickness. Uh, and in that, from the start, the door becomes the start, and then the other two shapes uh, become the shapes that I'm going to pluck out. So looking at live boolean, I can see how it's going to turn out. Uh, and both of these are actually it set as intersecting geometry. And then I basically just made a boolean mesh uh, off of the boolean men menu. It makes it almost like sort of a skinned uh, tool. 
and then you know like if you were doing a pinned topology uh, it's basically the the union mesh that it makes so make boolean mesh and then I reappended it to the model and I ended up with my clean doors and that's how it works out it's pretty cool stuff so just a little a few other tricks uh, that I'll I'll come to explain a little bit more uh, next stream but thanks a lot guys I appreciate it and I'll see you next time awesome thank you have fun go create <laughs>